Hello everyone. It's a great honor as well as a great pleasure for me to read for you Stan's forward to the book of Albert Hoffman, LSD, My Problem Child. The use of psychedelic substances can be traced back for millennia to the dawn of human history since time immemorial plant materials containing powerful consciousness expanding compounds have been used in many different parts of the world to induce non-ordinary states of consciousness in various ritual and spiritual contexts. They have played an important role in shamanic practice, aboriginal healings, healing ceremonies, rites of passage, mysteries of death and rebirth, and spiritual traditions. The ancient and native cultures using psychedelic materials held them in great esteem and considered them to be sacraments, flesh of the gods, quote unquote. Human groups which had at their disposal psychedelic plants took advantage of their entheogenic effect. Entheogenic means literally awakening the divine within and made them the principal vehicle of their ritual and spiritual life. The preparations made from these plants mediated for these people experiential contact with the archetypal dimensions of reality, deities, mythological realms, power animals, numinous forces and aspects of nature. Another important area where states induced by psychedelics played a crucial role was diagnosing and healing various disorders. Anthropological literature contains many reports indicating that native cultures use psychedelics to cultivate intuition and extraordinary perception for a variety of divinatory as well as practical purposes such as finding lost persons and objects, obtaining information about people in remote locations, and for following the movement of the game these people were hunting. In addition, psychedelic experiences served as an important source of artistic inspiration, providing ideas for rituals, paintings, sculptures, songs, in the history of Chinese medicine, reports about psychedelic substances can be traced back about 3,000 years. The legendary divine potion referred to as Haoma in the ancient Persian Zendavestas and the Soma in the Indian Vedas was used by the indo iranian tribes millennia ago. The mystical states of consciousness induced by Soma were very likely the principal source of the Vedic and the Hindu religion. Preparations from different varieties of help have been smoked and ingested under various names. Hashish, Charas, Pan, Ganja, Kif, Marijuana. In Asia, in Africa, in the Caribbean areas, for recreation, pleasure, during religious ceremonies. They represented an important sacrament for such diverse groups as the Indian Brahmins, certain orders of Sufis, ancient Scythians, Jamaican Rastafarians. The ceremonial use of various psychedelic substances also has long history in Central America highly effective mind-altering plants were well known in several uh, pre-Columbian Indian cultures, among Aztecs, Maya, and Olmecs, Mazatecs. The most famous of these are the Mexican cactus peyote, Antelonium levini, the sacred mushroom, Teonanatl, Teonanacatl, uh, uh, Psilocybe Mexicana and Ololiuqui, the morning glory seed, Rivera Corimbosa. Now, these materials have been used as sacraments until this day 
by several Mexican tribes, which all Mazatecs, Cora people, and others, and by the Native uh, American Church. The famous South American Yahe, or Ayahuasca, is a decoction from a jungle uh, liana, Banisteropsis capi, with other plant additives. The Amazonian area is also known for a variety of psychedelic snuffs, Virola calophylla, Piptadenia peregrina, preparations from the bark of the shrub iboga, Tabernante iboga, have been used by African tribes in lower dosage as a stimulant during lion hunts and long canyon trips, and in higher doses as ritual sacrament. The above list represents only a small fraction of psychedelic compounds that have been used over many centuries in various countries, various countries of the world. The impact that the experience encountered in these states had on spiritual and cultural life of pre-industrial societies has been enormous. People from our culture who see the use of psychedelic plants as something that is practiced in exotic and primitive cultures and is alien to our own tradition, would be very surprised to find out that psychedelic substances very likely profoundly influenced the ancient Greek culture, generally considered the cradle of European civilization. Many giants of Greek culture, including Plato, Aristotle, Archipiades, Pinandros, and others were initiates in the Mediterranean mysteries of death and rebirth, held in the name of Demeter and Persephone, Dionysus, Attis, Adonis, Orpheus, and others. According to the theory proposed by research them that included Albert Hoffman himself, the sacred potion Kikeon administered to thousands of initiates in the Eleusian mysteries every five years for almost 2,000 years contained an ergot alkaloid similar to LSD. Psychedelics were also very likely ingredients in the wines used in, for the Bacchanalia. The long history of ritual use of psychedelic plants contrasts sharply with a relatively short history of scientific efforts to identify their psychoactive alkaloids and to study their effects. The first psychedelic substance that was, that was synthesized in a chemically pure form and systematically explored under laboratory conditions was mescaline, the active alkaloid from the peyote cactus. Clinical experiments conducted with the substance in the first three decades of the 20th century focused on the phenomenology of the masculine experience and its interesting effects on artistic perception and creative expression. Surprisingly, they did not reveal its therapeutic, heuristic, and atheogenic potential. Kurt Beringer, author of the influential book Da Mescaline Rausch, Mescaline Inebriation, published in 1927, concluded that masculine induced a toxic psychosis. After these pioneering clinical experiments with masculine, very little research was done in this fascinating problem until Albert Hoffman's 1942 epoch-making serendipitous discovery of the psychedelic properties of LSD-25, or the ethylamide of lysergic acid, a substance of extraordinary potency. This new semi-synthetic ergo derivative active in incredibly minute quantities of micrograms or gamma, millionths of a gram, started a revolutionary era in research in psychopharmacology, 
psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, because of the incredible promises it held in many different fields of research, this new substance appears to be Albert Hoffman's prodigious child. The discovery of powerful psychedelic effects of minuscule dosage of LSD started what has been called a quote, golden era of psychopharmacology, unquote. During a relatively short period of time, the joint efforts of biochemists, pharmacologists, neurophysiologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, succeeded in laying the foundation of new scientific discipline that can be referred to as pharmacology of consciousness. The active substances from several remaining psychedelic plants were chemically identified and prepared in chemically pure form. Following the discovery of psychedelic effects of LSD-25, Albert Hoffman identified the active principles of the Mexic magic mushrooms, psilocybin mexicana, psilocybin, psilocin, and that of ololiuqui, or morning glory seeds, Ridea corimbosa, which turned out to be uh, lysergic acid amide closely related to LSD-25. The armamentarium of psychedelic substances was further enriched by psychoactive derivatives of tryptamine, DMT, DET, DBT, the methyl tryptamine, the ethyl tryptamine, the proper tryptamine, synthesized and studied by the Budapest group of chemists headed by Stephen Sara. The active principle from the African shrub, uh, Tabernanche iboga, ibogaine, and the pure alkaloid from ayahuasca's main ingredient, by Mr. Yopis Scapi, known under the names harmalin, diagelin, and telepathin, had already been isolated and chemically identified earlier in the 20th century. In the 1950s, a wide range of psychedelic alkaloids in pure form was available to researchers. It was now possible to study their properties in the laboratory and explore the phenomenology of their clinical effects and their therapeutic potential. The revolution triggered by Albert Hoffman's serendipitous discovery of LSD was underway. After the publication of the first clinical paper on LSD by Walter Stoll in the late 1940s, in which the author described the effects of this extraordinary substance in a group of volunteers and psychiatric patients, and mentioned its possible therapeutic potential, Albert Hoffman Wonder Child became an overnight sensation in the scientific world. Never before in the history of science had a single substance had so much promise in such a wide variety of fields. For neuropharmacologists and neurophysiologists, the discovery of LSD meant the beginning of a golden era of research that could solve many puzzles concerning neuroreceptors, synaptic transmitters, chemical antagonism, the role of serotonin in the brain, and the intricate biochemical interactions underlying cerebral processes. Experimental psychiatrists saw LSD as a unique means for creating a laboratory model for natural, naturally occurring functional or endogenous psychoses. They hoped that the experimental psychosis induced by minuscule dosages of the substance could provide unparalleled insights into the nature of these mysterious disorders and open new avenues for the treatment. It was suddenly conceivable that the brain and other parts of the body could under certain circumstances produce small quantities of a substance similar to LSD, with similar effects. 
this meant that the disorders like schizophrenia would not be mental disorders, but metabolic aberrations that could be counteracted by specific chemical interventions. The promise of this research was nothing less than fulfillment of the dream of biologically oriented psychiatrists, the holy grail of psychiatry, the test tube cure for schizophrenia. LSD was also highly recommended as an extraordinary, unconventional teaching device that would make it possible for clinical psychiatrists, psychologists, medical students, and nurses to spend a few hours in the world of their patients and, as a result of it, to understand them better, be able to communicate with them more effectively and improve their ability to help them. Thousands of mental health professionals took advantage of this unique opportunity. These experiments brought surprising and astonishing results. They not only provided deep insights into the world of psychiatric patients, but also revolutionized the understanding of the nature and dimensions of human psyche. Many found that the current model limiting the psyche to postnatal biography and the Freudian individual unconscious was superficial and inadequate. The new map of psyche that emerged out of this research added two large transbiographical domains, the perinatal level, closely related to memory of biological birth, and the transpersonal level, harboring the historical and archetypal domains of the collective unconscious as envisioned by C.G. Jung. Early experiments with LSD showed that the roots of emotional and psychosomatic disorders were not limited to traumatic memories from childhood and infancy, as traditional psychiatrists had assumed but reached much deeper into the psyche, into the perinatal and transpersonal regions. Reports from psychedelic psychotherapists revealed LSD unique potential as a powerful tool offering the possibility of deepening and accelerating the psychotherapeutic process. Using LSD as a catalyst, it became possible to extend the range of applicability of psychotherapy to categories of patients that previously have been difficult to reach. Sexual deviants, alcoholics, narcotic drug addicts, criminal recidivists. Particularly valuable and promising were the early efforts to use LSD psychotherapy to work with terminal cancer patients. Research on this population showed that LSD was able to relieve some severe pain, often even in those patients who had not responded to medication with narcotics. In a large percentage of these patients, it was also possible to ease or even eliminate difficult emotional and psychosomatic symptoms, such as depression, general tension, insomnia, alleviate the fear of death, increase the quality of their life during their remaining days, and positively transform the experience of dying. For historians and critics of art, the LSD experiments provided extraordinary new insights into the psychology and psychopathology of art particularly various modern movements, such as abstractionism, cubism, surrealism, fantastic realism, and into painting and sculptures of various native, so-called primitive cultures. For professional painters who participated in LSD research, the psychedelic session often marked a radical change in, in the artistic expression. Their imagination became much richer, their colors more vivid, 
their style considerably freer. They could also often reach into deeper recesses of their unconscious psyche and tap archetypal sources of inspiration. On occasion, people who had never painted were able to produce extraordinary pieces of art. LSD experimentation brought also fascinating observations which were of great interest to spiritual teachers and scholars of comparative religions. The mystical experiences frequently observed in LSD sessions offered a radically new understanding of a wide variety of phenomena from the world of religion, including shamanism, the rites of passage, the ancient mysteries of death and rebirth, the Eastern spiritual philosophies and the mystical traditions of the world. The fact that LSD and other psychedelic substances were able to trigger a broad range of spiritual experiences became the subject of a heated scientific discussion. They revolve around the fascinating problem concerning the nature and value of this quote instant end of quote or quote chemical end of quote mysticism. LSD research seemed to be well on its way to fulfill all the above promises and expectations when it was suddenly interrupted by the unsupervised mass experimentation of the young generation. In the infamous Harvard affair, Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, and Ralph Metzner left the university. Leary and Alpert leaving teaching posts and Metzner leaving a fellowship. After their overeager proselytizing of LSD and psilocybin, the ensuing repressive measures of administrative, legal, and political nature had very little effect on street use of LSD and other psychedelics, but they drastically terminated legitimate clinical research. However, while the problem associated with this development were blown out of proportion by sensation hunting journalists, this was not the only reason why LSD and other psychedelics were rejected by Euro-American culture. An important contributing factor was also the attitude of technological societies towards non ordinary states of consciousness. And as I mentioned earlier, all ancient and pre-industrial societies held these states in high esteem, whether they were induced by psychedelic plants or some of the many powerful non-drug technologies of the sacred, fasting, sleep deprivation, social and sensory isolation, dancing, chanting, music, drumming, physical pain. Members of these social groups had the opportunity to repeatedly experience non-ordinary states of consciousness during their lives in a variety of sacred and secular contexts. By comparison, the industrial civilizations have pathologized non-ordinary states developed effective means of suppressing them when they occurred spontaneously and have rejected or even outlawed the contexts and tools that can facilitate them. Because of the resulting naivete and ignorance concerning non-ordinary states, Western culture was unprepared to accept and incorporate the extraordinary mind-altering properties and power of LSD and other psychedelics. The sudden invasion of the Dionysian element from the depth of the unconscious and the heights of the superconscious was too threatening for the puritanical values of Euro-American society. In addition, the irrational and transrational nature of psychedelic experience seriously challenged the very foundations of the materialistic worldview of Western science. The existence and nature of these experiences could not be explained in the context of mainstream theories, 
and seriously undermine the metaphysical assumptions concerning priority of matter over consciousness on which Western culture has built. It also threatened the leading myth of the industrial world by showing that true fulfillment does not come from achievement of material goals, but from a profound mystical experience. It was not just the culture at large that was unprepared for the psychedelic experience. It was also the helping profession. For most psychiatrists and psychologists, psychotherapy meant disciplined face-to-face -face discussions or free association on the couch. The intense emotions and dramatic physical manifestations in psychedelic sessions appeared to them to be too close to what they were used to associate with psychopathology. It was hard for them to imagine that such states could be healing and transformative. As a result, they did not trust the reports about the extraordinary power of psychedelic psychotherapy coming from those colleagues who had enough courage to take the chances and do psychedelic therapy or from their clients. To complicate the situation even further, many of the phenomena occurring in psychedelic sessions could not be understood within the context of theories dominating academic thinking. The possibility of reliving birth or episodes from embryonic life, obtaining accurate information about world history and mythology from the collective unconscious, experiencing archetypal realities and karmic memories, or perceiving remote events in out-of-body states were simply too fantastic to be believable for an average professional. Yet those of us who had the chance to work with LSD and were willing to radically change our theoretical understanding of the psyche and practical strategy of therapy were able to see and appreciate the enormous potential of psychedelics, both as therapeutic tools and as substances of extraordinary heuristic value. In one of my early books, I suggested that the potential significance of LSD and other psychedelics for psychiatry and psychology was comparable to the value the microscope had for biology and medicine, or the telescope has for astronomy. My later experience with psychedelics only confirmed this initial impression. These substances function as unspecific amplifiers that increase the cathexis, the energetic charge associated with the deep unconscious contents of the psyche and make them available for conscious processing. This unique property of psychedelics makes it possible to study psychological undercurrents that govern our experiences and behaviors to a depth that cannot be matched by any other method or tool available in modern mainstream psychiatry and psychology. In addition, it offers unique opportunities for healing of emotional and psychosomatic disorders, for positive personality transformation and consciousness evolution. Naturally, the tools of this power carry with them greater risks than more conservative and far less effective tools currently accepted and used by mainstream psychiatry, such as verbal psychotherapy or tranquilizing medication. Responsible clinical research has shown that these risks can be minimized by responsible use and careful control of the set and setting. However, legislators re responding to unsupervised mass use of psychedelics did not get their information from scientific publications, but from the stories of sensation hunting journalists. The legal and administrative sanctions against psychedelics did not deter lay experimentation, but they terminated all legitimate scientific research of these substances. By an unfortunate 
combination of circumstances, Albert Hoffmann's wonder child became a problem child. For those of us who had the privilege to explore and experience the extraordinary potential of psychedelics, this was a tragic loss of psychi for psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy. We felt that these unfortunate developments wasted what was probably the single most important opportunity in the history of these disciplines. Had it been possible to avoid the unnecessary mass hysteria and continue responsible research of psychedelics, they could have radically transformed the theory and practice of psychiatry. This research would have brought a new understanding of the psyche and of consciousness that could become an integral part of a comprehensive new scientific paradigm of the 21st century. LSD researchers responded in different ways to the legal and political sanctions against psychedelics. Some of them grudgingly accepted them and reluctantly returned to mainstream therapeutic practices, which now seemed to, to them boring and painfully ineffective. A few of us attempted to develop non-drug methods for inducing non-ordinary states of consciousness with the experiential spectrum and healing potential comparable to psychedelics. There were also those who saw the extraordinary benefits of LSD psychotherapy and decided not to sacrifice the well-being of their clients to irrational and scientifically unsubstantiated legislation, and they continued their work in secret. In addition to the therapeutic value of psychedelics, many of these professionals were also aware of the entheogenic potential of these substances. For this reason, they understood their work with LSD to be not only therapeutic practice, but also religious activity in the best sense of the word. From this perspective, the legal sanctions against psychedelics appeared to be not only unfounded and misguided, but represented a serious infringement of religious freedom guaranteed by the American Constitution. At present, when more than three decades elapsed since official LSD research was effectively terminated, I can attempt to evaluate the past history of this substance and glimpse into the future. After having personally conducted over the last 50 years more than 4,000 psychedelic sessions, I have developed great awe and respect for these substances and their enormous positive as well as negative potential. They are powerful tools and like any tool, they can be used skillfully, ineptly or destructively. The result will be critically dependent on the set and setting. The question whether LSD is a phenomenal medicine or a devil's drug makes as little sense as similar questions asked about the positive or negative potential of a knife. Naturally, we will get very different report from a surgeon who, ba who bases his or her judgment on a successful operation and from the police chief who investigates murders committed with knives in back alleys of New York City. It would also make little sense to judge the use usefulness or dangers of a knife by watching children who play with it without adequate maturity and skill. Similarly, the image of LSD will vary whether we focus on the results of responsible clinical or spiritual use, naive and careless mass self-experimentation of the young generation, or the deliberately destructive experiments of the army or of the CIA. Until it is clearly understood that the results of the administration of psychedelics are critically influenced by the factor of set and setting, there is no hope for rational decisions in regard to psychedelic drug policies. I firmly believe that psychedelics can be used in such a way <clears throat> that the benefits far outweigh the risk. This has been amply proven by millennia of safe ritual and spiritual use of psychedelics by generations of shamans. 
individual healers and entire Aboriginal cultures. However, the Western industrial civilization has so far abused nearly all its discoveries. And there's not much hope that psychedelics will make an exception unless we rise as a group to a higher level of consciousness and emotional maturity. Whether or not psychedelics will return into psychiatry and will again become part of the therapeutic armamentarium is a complex problem and its solution will probably be determined not only by the result of scientific research, but also by a variety of political, legal, economic and mass psychological factors. However, I believe that Western society is at present much better equipped to accept and assimilate psychedelics than it was in the 1950s. At the time when psychiatrists and psychologists started to experiment with LSD, psychotherapy was limited to verbal exchanges between therapists and clients. Intense emotions and active behavior were referred as quote unquote acting out and were seen as violations of basic therapeutic rules. Psychedelic sessions were on the other side of the spectrum, evoking dramatic emotions, psychomotor excitement and vivid perceptual changes. They thus seemed to be more like states that psychiatrists considered pathological and tried to suppress by all means than conditions to which one would attribute therapeutic potential. This was reflected in the terms hallucinogens, delirogens, psychotomimetics, and experimental psychosis, used initially for psychedelics and the states induced by them. In any case, psychedelic sessions more resembled scenes from anthropological movies about healing rituals or quote unquote primitive cultures and other ceremonies that those expected in a psychoanalyst's office. In addition, many of the experiences and observations from psychedelic sessions seem to seriously challenge the image of the human psyche and of the universe developed by Newtonian Cartesian science and consider to be accurate and definite descriptions of the quote unquote objective reality. Psychedelic subjects reported experiential identification with other people, animals, and various aspects of nature, during which they gained access to new information about areas about which they previously had no intellectual knowledge. The same was true about experiential excursions into the lives of their human and animal ancestors, as well as racial, collective and karmic memories. On occasion, this new information was drawn from experiences involving reliving biological birth and memories of prenatal life, encounters with archetypal beings and visits of mythological realms of different cultures of the world. In out-of-body experiences, experimental subjects were able to witness and accurately describe remote events occurring in locations that were outside of the range of their senses. None of these happenings were considered possible in the context of traditional materialistic science, and yet in psychedelic sessions, they were observed frequently. This naturally caused deep conceptual turmoil and confusion in the minds of conventionally trained experimenters. Under these circumstances, many professionals choose to stay away from this area to preserve their scientific worldview and to protect their common sense and sanity. The last three decades have brought many revolutionary changes that have profoundly influenced the climate in the world of psychotherapy. Humanistic and transpersonal psychologies have developed powerful experiential techniques that emphasize deep regression, direct expression of intense emotion, and body work leading to release of physical energies. Among these new approaches to self-exploration are Gestalt practice, bioenergetics, and other neo-Reikian methods, primal therapy, 
rebirthing and holotropic breathwork. The inner experiences and outer manifestations, as well as all therapeutic strategies in these therapies bear a great similarity to those observed in psychedelic sessions. These non-drug therapeutic strategies involve a similar spectrum of experiences, as well as comparable conceptual challenges. As a result, for therapists practicing along these lines, the introduction of psychedelics would represent the next logical step, rather than a dramatic change in their practice. The culture at large shows encouraging signs as well. Grassroots movements around birth and death, for example, reveal a growing discontent with the sanitization of powerful experiences. Today, midwives can be state certified and home births are increasingly popular, whereas in the 1950s, they were considered backwards or primitive. People can choose to die at home thanks to the hospice movement instead of in sterile hospital settings. Previously eccentric healing techniques like massage and acupuncture are widely accepted, even by health insurance plans. Eastern spiritual practices have moved to the mainstream of Western culture, with meditation centers and yoga schools to be found in every major city. Increasingly, the authority of traditional medical science with its firm separation between mind and body is becoming suspect, and people are seeking more holistic alternatives. These shifts may signal that society is more ready for psychedelics today. Moreover, the Newtonian Cartesian thinking in science, which in the 60s enjoyed great authority and popularity, has been progressively undermined by astonishing developments in a variety of disciplines. This has happened to such an extent that an increasing number of scientists feel an urgent need for an entirely different worldview, a new scientific paradigm. Salient examples of this development are philosophical implications of quantum relativistic physics, David Bohm's theory of holo movement, Carl Bribram's holographic theory of the brain, Ilya Prigozhin's theory of dissipative structures, Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphogenetic fields, Gregory Bateson's brilliant synthesis of systems and information theory, cybernetics, anthropology, and psychology, and particularly Erwin Laszlo's concept of the Akashic field, his connectivity hypothesis, and his integral theory of everything. It's very encouraging to see all these new developments that are in an incorrect, incorrect conciliable conflict with traditional science seem to be compatible with the findings of psychedelic research and with transpersonal psychology. Even more encouraging than the changes in the general and scientific climate is the fact that in a few cases, researchers of the younger generations in the United States and abroad have in recent years been able to obtain official permission to start programs of psychedelic therapy involving LSD, psilocybin, DMT, MDMA, and ketamine. I hope that this is the beginning of a re renaissance of interest in psychedelic research that will eventually return these extraordinary tools into the hands of responsible therapists. I personally believe that in the future, LSD will be seen as one of the most influential discoveries of the 20th century, and that Albert Hoffmann's problem child will again be seen as it should have been seen all along as a wonder child that grew up in, in a dysfunctional society. I would like to end this forward on a personal note. Writing it gives me the opportunity to express my profound gratitude to Albert Hoffmann for everything that his discovery brought into my personal and professional life and the lives of countless others who used his gift responsibly and with respect that this extraordinary tool deserves. I have had the privilege 
to know Albert personally and met him repeatedly on various occasions. Over the years, I have developed great affection and deep admiration for him, not only as an outstanding scientist, but also as an extraordinary human being. After what will soon be a century of a full, blessed and productive life, he radiates amazing vitality, curiosity and love for all creation. I had another opportunity to meet Albert during my recent visit in Switzerland, where I was teaching an advanced training module on holotropic breathwork and entitled Fantastic Art. It was held in the Hans Rudi Giger Museum in Gruyere, and Albert came as a guest of honor. After we had lunch and enjoyed a guided tour through the museum, during which he braved three floors of steep stairs, he sat down with our group for a discussion, which turned into his passionate apotheosis of the beauty and mystery of creation. He spoke about the miraculous chemistry that gives rise to the pigments responsible for the colors of flowers and butterfly wings about the gratitude he felt for being alive and participating in consciousness, and about the need to embrace creation in its totality, including its shadow side. Because without polarity, the universe we live in could not have been created. When he left, we all felt we just had attended a darshan with a spiritual teacher. It was clear that Albert had joined the group of great scientists like Albert Einstein and Isaac Newton, for whom rigorous pursuit of their discipline brought the recognition of the miraculous divine order underlying the world of matter and the natural phenomena. I would like to use this opportunity to wish him all the best for his forthcoming auspicious 100th birthday and hope we will enjoy his presence in the world for many more years. Stanislav Grof. Mill Valley, California, October 2005.